We've been looking at uh, male violence. Uh, not all species have male violence necessarily uh, uh, on an ascendant basis, as we've heard with lions. Um, another theme, I think, that in spite of the focus which is on violence is that conflict and cooperation seem to be co-evolved in humans. Uh, we not only uh, are good at uh, fighting, and of course we have several kinds of fighting, uh, highly reactive and sometimes coolly planned, um, but we also have means of cooperation not only within groups, but within large regions, as uh, Polly Wiesner told us about. <clears throat> so we're, uh, in fact, uh, a bit like the chimpanzees, who are uh, true experts at conflict resolution, as well as at conflict. And it seems to be true of humans as well, uh, whether there's a phylogenetic connection there, or whether it's uh, something that happened in parallel, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, one thing about male violence is that it seems to breed more male violence. That is, uh, chimpanzees retaliate as individuals uh, if, if they get uh, treated badly. Humans do this as groups. Chimpanzees don't seem to have a group sense of revenge or violence. And uh, feuding is very widespread among humans. And uh, it's intensified by uh, culturally uh, promoted grief over loss of loved ones. So with us, the revenge theme complicates uh, uh, the, the basic uh, pattern of killing by intensifying the feelings that are involved. <clears throat> now, uh, for humans, uh, we look at hunter-gatherers because they are uh, the best possible exemplars of what was going on earlier. And especially the culturally modern hunter-gatherers are models for the people who are actually putting the finishing touches on human nature 100,000 years ago. And that probably has something to do with uh, the fact that today uh, we do some things that are quite similar, and you've seen, you've been exposed to quite a few uh, hunter-gatherers uh, today, and I think for sure that you've noticed the similarities between them and us. Uh, we've had some interesting uh, environmental variables brought in with respect to what causes warfare, the, our biggest form of male violence, perhaps, and uh, one of them has to do with population pressure, and it makes sense, certainly, that uh, the more uh, resources are scarce, the more people are likely to fight. But there's a second uh, variable that was introduced by Carol Ember, which is environmental unpredictability. Environmental unpredictability uh, basically seems to make people socialize their children for mistrust, and it makes warfare likely. The unpredictability per se uh, sounds a little bit abstract, but if you think about uh, having gone through a famine or having gone through recurrent famines, it gets into your head and makes, makes warfare more likely. Maybe just as a final note here, uh, we are apparently retur returning to environmental unpredictability in the form of climate change. And uh, I don't want to be a calamity howler, but maybe we should watch out in the future. Thank you. I'm signaling to Chris to stay here because uh, we've now got uh, some questions, uh, Q&A &A time. And uh, so if we start with him, then um, uh, we can let him sit down after that. So, so here's a question. Um, maybe made in protest. Why do anthropologists refer to women as a resource, like food or water? If I could pick the exact question I didn't want to walk straight into, uh, it would be that buzzsaw. Uh, however, uh, males do 
compete for females using violence. And it is uh, because females breed, they're a valuable resource in terms of a larger evolutionary picture. Uh, and uh, in fact, you do not have women rating other groups for men. Uh, that's about all I can say. Uh, another question for you. <laughs> Carry on like that, and women will come and raid for you. Um, what other characteristics are associated with cultures where bullying or arrogance are discouraged, as you were talking about this morning? Uh, yes, I, uh, my work on egalitarianism has led to some media requests for wise comments about bullying, which is our latest uh, big thing. Uh, to talk about. And um, basically, in hunter gatherer groups, uh, all the males, of course, who have varying uh, abilities and accomplishments, are, define one another as political equals. Whether this is just among males or not uh, is a question because there are so few societies of hunter gatherers where women are, have a full hunting role. Uh, I only know of really one beautiful one, which I could tell you about, but I shan't. Um, so males in egalitarian societies, and this includes tribal agriculturalists in, who live in small groups as well, uh, what the males do in effect is they have an agreement among themselves that nobody is allowed to be ascendant. And anyone who, uh, we saw a very nice quote from the Bushman about cooling the uh, proud hunter's ego and so forth. Uh, so uh, really, uh, males are not allowed to dominate. Uh, they're not even allowed to make a hint at domination because they'll be put down by ridicule right away. If they actually try to become despotic in a hunter-gatherer band, they're killed. Uh, out of my sample of 58, well, of 49 societies earlier, uh, almost half of the groups showed uh, bullying types of males or aggressive shamans who became evil uh, being killed by their groups. So uh, the anti-bullying ethos is very ancient. Now, if you get out on a schoolyard, you'll see that uh, Dominance hierarchies form naturally, and they form more strongly among males than females. And of course, there you have uh, basically a law or a rule that you don't fight on the playground. And I spent two years as an elementary teacher a long time ago, and I know that you can't stop them. But what you do is you separate the little kids, <laughs> and, and you, you keep them apart for about a minute to a minute and a half while they cool off, and then it's okay. So bullying is uh, not only part of the human tendencies toward dominance, but it also involves cultural reactions to that. I think that's about all I can say. Thanks, Chris. Okay, we'll let you off the hook there. I'll ask Anne to come up. <clears throat> So male violence is so obvious, and we, we've focused on males. We've got some various questions about females. Uh, but here is vic females as a victim. Um, wh why do chimp male chimps kill females? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we, I, I think when they kill females in another group, the effect is to, to make more space. That, so they're removing competitors. Um, it, it does seem, I mean, it, it's been very surprising to people that, that males do sometimes kill females. Sometimes they're older. What, what we know is that females don't generally move into another group once um, they've settled. And so um, those females can't be mates of the uh, males from another community. Except in uh, the Mahali case? Uh, okay. Um, I, I guess I, I guess that what I'm thinking. Yeah. I, I, it, Richard's um, referring to the fact that in in one group in Tanzania, all of the males were killed, and then the males 
sorry, the females of that group did move into the new group. But, but when you're just picking off individuals like Richard was talking about, um, I, I think you're, you're just weakening the group next door and allowing the community to expand its range. Okay, great. So um, then what kind of violence do you see by females? Yeah, actually, females are pretty nasty to each other in chimps. And uh, the, as I said, they, um, females generally move into another group before they start breeding. So those females are not generally relatives in the group. And when a new female comes in, um, the resident females are quite aggressive to them. And, and sometimes they'll gang up. And we've seen females be evicted, or not able to join a group because of aggression by other females. And then uh, we also see females occasionally killing each other's infants. And, and that's, that's been kind of surprising and shocking to people. But it does seem to be, at Gombe, several different females have been seen to do that now. And they seem to be females killing infants of females who share a core area with them and uh, maybe competitors later on. So, yeah, female chimps can be really quite nasty to each other. Um, thanks. And um, then um, there's a question about lions. Uh, are there any behavioral characteristics in the male lions when they kill cubs that would distinguish that kind of killing from uh, predation? Uh, for instance, are the cubs ever eaten? Um, sometimes we haven't this hasn't been observed very much because lions do everything at night and so it's actually quite difficult to um, to we, we haven't seen people haven't seen very many instances of males killing cubs but there are some and there are some on film and uh, in that case uh, the male killed three cubs and he partially ate one but he just it was very a sort of clinical behavior I mean they, he, he came upon the cubs he just picked one of them up by the head and shook it and bit into its head and it was dead and then he went on to the next cub so it was really as though it was directed towards killing cubs rather than eating them um, do you want to answer this question um, please discuss corporal punishment in animal societies in relationship to aggression <laughs> no thanks <laughs> um, so, well, but, but I mean, uh, yeah, so, so if the, if say the young ones, you know, like like in humans, so, so, say the question again. Well, if the young ones behave badly mm -hmm. uh, and are aggressive, do mm -hmm. they experience corporal punishment mm -hmm. from their elders? Yes, they do sometimes, uh, and particularly actually when um, females are together and their kids are playing together, and young males of sort of around about eight or nine, they'll start baiting other females, and those females are still strong enough to really beat them up. And, uh, and they get very annoyed about them. And some, sometimes the males start throwing sand and just being generally annoying, and the, ma the females do attack them sometimes. Thanks a lot. So, so th there are some um, uh, indications in the chimp world, I think, of uh, variations in aggressiveness among communities. And one of the fascinating questions is going to be whether we can detect cultural variation in that, maybe due to the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Anne. So. Don, uh, Don, are you um, uh, ready to come up? And um, your first question is, what do you think will be the result of the increase in men taking testosterone? So the easy answer is, is yes. Uh, increasing, <laughs> increasing concentrations of testosterone in the blood are likely to lead to an initiation of aggression. Uh, consider roid rage, uh, consider uh, highly muscular athletes in various forms of aggression uh, off the field. But you wouldn't want to be simplistic about it. And so there are biological considerations to add and environmental considerations. The biological considerations would be, yes, you have increased testosterone levels, but what about androgen receptor concentrations in the brain? What about the concentrations of those proteins which are co-regulators, which will allow, allow the androgen receptor to be effective? And also, the, the subtlest idea is how are the testosterone-sensitive neurons hooked up? In some of us, they may be hooked up in a powerful form, and in others of us, not so powerful. So those are biological. On the environmental side, uh, there are multiple opportunities for positive feedback phenomena. Uh, that same uh, uh, professor and psychiatrist, uh, James Gilligan, wh whom I quoted, 
uh, said, a prison makes violent men more violent. And in terms of environmental factors, uh, uh, Professor Ember's talk and Professor uh, Wiesner's talk gave multiple examples. Um, don't go away. Um, just a quick follow-up. Uh, why is it you don't get negative feedback loop with testosterone? Um, you'd think it would start closing down uh, endogenous testosterone production. If you're producing your own testosterone, there are negative feedback loops. Testosterone comes, t turns off the synthesis of uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which turns off the anterior pituitary, which turns off the testis. But you can overwhelm that pharmacologically. By especially high doses. Especially high doses. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, now uh, women again. Um, how, how about female aggression and testosterone? And the, the question I was thinking about is in relationship to the hormonal cycle, but uh, testosterone is at much lower levels in women, but nevertheless, it's there. So mm -hmm. what, what relationship to aggression? I think completely uh, independent of testosterone, we give women plenty of reasons to be aggressive. <laughs> um, but... Um, to quote the Blanchards, the, a famous uh, pair of bi biological behaviorists out in the Uni University of Hawaii, men fight uh, to have women and food, and women fight uh, to protect babies. And uh, that really doesn't depend very much on testosterone. Uh, protecting babies and lactation uh, is an extremely complicated thing. You need nothing less than estrogens, progestins, stress hormones, opioid hormones, and prolactin. And testosterone is not even in the ball game. So I would say that the major biologically justified reason for aggression in women, other than political reasons, uh, would be childcare, and that's testosterone free. And, and so no relationship to the uh, ovarian cycle? Not really. Um, okay, so I'm not sure I don't have time. Um, go. <laughs> Wait a minute. There, there, there was going to be a, another question, Don, <laughs> if, if we're okay for time. Um, th this is a sophisticated question. Uh, to what extent and by what means uh, are self-control mechanisms uh, involving the frontal lobe impaired during moments of rage, and how may interventions such as meditation affect this? So for the first part of the question, uh, you, you offered a slide which had the uh, changes in activity of the prefrontal cortex altered during moments of aggression. Was it aggressive mentation? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, in reactive aggression. Mm -hmm. And so um, about two weeks ago, I attended a, uh, a meeting of psychoanalysts, and they said, yes, uh, Freud was right. We have a part of the brain for the id, that would be the hypothalamus, part of the brain for the ego, that would be most of the cerebral cortex, and part of the brain for the superego, and that would be the prefrontal cortex. And as a person who does this for a living, I have to say uh, that that summary is not so bad. Now, in, in terms of meditation, um, I would turn to the uh, work of Richard Davidson, who's a professor of psychi psychology at the University of Wisconsin, and he does talk about changes in activity in the brain during meditation, during trained by trained meditators. But I would caution you that first, uh, those imaging studies don't have adequate spatial resolution, they don't have adequate temporal resolution, and when something lights up in the brain, you don't know, in a, in a, in a scanning study, you don't know if it's excitatory neurons that are lighting up or inhibitory neurons, and the functional consequences of those are the opposite of each other. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Um, let's see, uh, Patty Lambert. <laughs> Um, so, given that um, skeletons don't show flesh wounds, um, how can you know, we calculate an actual death rate of violence from archaeological material? I've done some work, and George Milner um, as well has done some work. Uh, he, he actually looked at a couple of studies of uh, bow and arrow violence among, I think, the Inga, and he also used the Bill study that I was talking about and looked at how many um, projectiles actually hit bone for those that are shot into a body, and it's about 25 to 30%. So I guess in some way you could extrapolate from the ones that you see in bone to how many might actually have affected um, people. How many of those would have been lethal? It's hard to say. As I mentioned, we have a bias towards those that are lethal in a death assemblage. 
Um, we can tell which ones are healed and which ones aren't. And in the, in the uh, remains that I've looked at, at least about 70% are unhealed um, and, and we're a cause of death. So we can't f figure it exactly, but that's the way we do things. We do the sa disease the same way. TB affects a certain number of, a certain amount of people in the bones, and from that you can, to some extent, extrapolate how many people might have been affected with TB from that. Thank you. This is a tough one for chimpanzees, of course, because um, I think it would be quite unusual for any of the chimps that are killed uh, in the intergroup killings to be recognizable from their bones. There are studies mm. of trauma uh, in chimpanzees. I know we've talked about well, possibly doing you know, this. Yeah, that, that's true. And, um, but the trauma that I'm familiar with mm -hmm. is, uh, is within group aggression, oh. where you find that males have got more um, depressions, canine uh, depressions, on the front of the face mm -hmm. and, and females on the back, representing the fact that males are chasing females but confronting males. Mm -hmm. so, but the actual deaths, you know, I mean, occasionally there might be a broken bone, but oh. uh, yeah, pretty tricky. Um, so here's a, um, a difficult one. Um, so you talked about, uh, like uh, Carol Amber, um, the relationship between population density and resource shortages. Mm -hmm. uh, does this mean that you are pessimistic about the human future? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that we're ever going to have a time when there's no war. I, I just don't see any evidence for that. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm not a total pessimist that, that we're always just, you know, the world is always going to be, I mean, we, most of us here anyways are living a pretty good life, so it's not like it's always happening everywhere, but it is always happening somewhere. Um, and so the, the thought that there could ever be a, a world without war, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's existed. Um, on the other hand, I, yeah, no, I don't. You know, I, I like to re remain optimistic, although I am a little worried about this climate change stuff. <laughs> because it, was a, it wasn't only in Southern California. The, the studies in the Southwest have also shown a very strong correlation between severe drought and very, very bad violence. And uh, there was an interesting study on the Great Plains that was done by Doug Bramforth that found the same thing. Fortifications uh, were built during periods of drought. And so that, that doesn't bode well for, for a time of climate change, but maybe we have other mechanisms now that, uh, that could help with that. Thanks a lot, Patty Lambert. <laughs> and Kim. Kim, Kim, Kim. OK. We're not going to go into all your gruesome details, but um, here is a question I don't, nobody else can answer. Why did they bury people alive? Why not kill them first? <laughs> Why? Well, a short but not very satisfying answer is because that was their belief system. But, um, I, I mean, I should mention that most of the people who were buried alive were unconscious before the dirt was actually put on them. So uh, it's, it's not like they were yelling and screaming and trying to climb out. Um, but, I mean, there, there's an issue of why the Aceh had such a strong belief system that adults, and particularly adult men who died or were killed, should not go to the grave unaccompanied. And, we, you know, we could get into some complex social philosophy about why they felt that it was really important for these people to have somebody accompanying them in whatever their view of the afterlife is. This led to very high levels of... Um, Sacri sacrificial victims um, after death. Uh, and then um, uh, you have described two societies in particular. Uh, maybe they were particularly violent. What do you think these societies represent about hunters and gatherers in general? Well, I think you put up the data, Richard. I saw a histogram that had hunter-gatherers, and you, if, if you paid attention to my rate, 600 uh, deaths per 100,000 uh, person years, my, my two groups would have fit in, in kind of in the middle of your graph a little bit towards the high end. Polly gave us a measure of the peaceful, the harmless people, the Kung, at 122, which still would have been higher than any rates ever experienced in the United States, even during the years of warfare. Um, there are ranges of violence in hunter-gatherers. Maybe 
uh, slightly more than a tenfold range, but across that entire range, you're still above the range of the United States in the 20th century, even at the lowest levels. Um, however, I do think it's really important that we develop some theory, particularly with intertribal warfare. One of the most fascinating things, and other people brought this up today, is that while I started out my talk with spectacular examples of kill on site against uh, other tribes, we also know there are places in the world ethnographically described where uh, tribes with different cultures and different languages have peaceful trading relationships and exchange mates. And we don't have really good theory for under what conditions your relationship with your neighbors will be kill on site and under what conditions will it be let's go trade with them. A program for the future. I think that ends the, um, the, the sort of first half of the questions. And now, Chris, you're going to take over? Yes, and please stay there. OK. <laughs> That's unfair. I, I was number three. Yeah, after all that work, you now have to answer to. Uh, the first question for Richard. What is the role of emotion, i.e. anger, in aggression? Are proactive and reactive aggression both products of the same emotional state, or are they mediated by different emotional affective states? I, I hasten to say that, that um, uh, I am not an expert in these areas, even though I was talking about it. And I, I would like to make the excuse that if we're going to get uh, different disciplines talking to each other, then, then you have to accept that not everyone is an expert. Um, but uh, from, from my reading of, uh, of the literature, uh, absolutely, the emotions are very similar. Uh, the, um, the same dopaminergic networks uh, or very similar may be involved in promoting the motivation, the anger, uh, that underlies both uh, proactive and reactive aggression. There's a really nice discussion of this by Adrian Rain in a book published within the last year called The Anatomy of Violence. So uh, the emotions may be the same. It's what happens to them as a consequence uh, of uh, the different mechanisms that's important. Uh, here's another question, which is a bit more empirical. Um, are chimps uh, within the group, are the killings typically of the type seen in indigenous human groups, i.e. elders, defective babies, and so forth? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I think it's quite difficult to talk about um, the typical killings within the groups, um, except in as much as the uh, highest frequency of deaths uh, within groups is of babies. And um, there, uh, it is still mysterious as to why the babies are killed within groups. It does not fit the standard sexual selection theory very easily, which is that the killers would be hastening the return to reproductive uh, availability of the female whose infant is killed. It's conceivable that that is uh, applying. Um, so it's a little bit mysterious as to why the infants uh, are killed. Um, and, uh, and then uh, of the remainder, I suppose the, the next category is adult males, adult or adolescent males. And some of those are um, high-ranking males. Uh, there are also some low-ranking males. Uh, there are ex-alpha males. Uh, and that's out of a total sample of less than 10. I can't remember what it is, six or seven. So there's a lot of variation, and we don't understand it. Um, the intergroup context is understood much better than the, the intra-group. Uh, this is for Robert Kelly. If you could come up, please. And the question is, have anthropologists studied modern primitives, that is, infants and toddlers, preschoolers, aged nine months to three years, for expressions of stranger discrimination and aggressive behaviors across cultures? That's perhaps a little bit out of your bailiwick. Mm. And I wonder if perhaps we could invite Carol up to uh, also chime in on this one. Let me state that this is a uh, yeah, profound, <laughs> profound question. <laughs> I don't know about uh, discrimination of stranger behaviors, but um, I do know something about study of aggression in children uh, in be on behavior observations. Some of that was done in uh, 
the six culture study, uh, which is a comparative behavior observation study of different societies. And um, the one thing uh, th that is pretty clear is uh, a cr uh, there is, males are, male baby, infants and toddlers, there is no observable difference in aggression till about age of three. Um, but uh, I don't know actually of any uh, dis discrimination studies done across cultures in terms of reacting to whom and why. So I, I really can't answer that question. Do you? Do you? Um, I yeah, I have no idea what I'm talking about here, but, um, but I'm a university professor, so that means I'll act as if I, I know what I'm talking about. Um, there, there, I wandered into the child enculturation literature a little bit, um, and there is a difference, uh, this sort of basic difference between what are called parent-reared kids and peer-reared kids. And if you were out in a, in a Micaea uh, ha hamlet, you would see you know, s some kids, not a large number, because there's not a large number of people out in one of those hamlets. And the, the little, the young children tend to be with their parents uh, a lot. They go out foraging, women go out foraging, they take kids with them. Um, when they're in the, the hamlets, the little kids tend to be with, with parents. When you go into the bigger villages that are outside the, f the, the forest, uh, bigger being, you know, a, a thousand or more people living living there. The the kids tend to run in these uh, age grades. They're like packs of wild animals that <laughs> that, that basically go from house to house, um, mostly not really causing trouble, but being an annoyance until they get something like candy, and then they they go uh, away. And they they, they 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 tend to run in these age groups. And often, they're handed little kids, especially girls, are handed little, little kids. And you know, so you'll see an eight-year-old girl carrying her, her two-year-old brother or, or sister around with, with her. And the kids spend a lot of time with kids their own age rather than with uh, adults. And, and, and some of the, the, the work done on this suggests that, that that does create some rather different modal personalities. And for peer-reared kids, the kids who run in these age grades, it tends to create more um, male-female st stereotypes and segregation of things that are considered boys' stuff and girls' stuff, or boys' activities and girls' activities. It, it, it tends to create a little more uh, aggressive activities in, in boys who are, are peer-reared than boys who tend to be more adult-reared. Um, children who are um, uh, parent re reared, um, when they want something, the, they they tend to think about how do I manipulate the, the the sort of world of technology and the natural world in order to get what I want. So I I'm I'm hungry, uh, I need a digging stick to go dig up tubers. So they go make a digging stick and go dig up tubers. And in peer reared kids, they tend to look around and go, who's got it? How am I related to them? How do I get it from, from them? So there's a little more manipulation of social relationships rather than of tech, technology. And that, when I read that, I said, this, this helps to explain to me why you get a change once you get larger sedentary villages. This is a much longer argument here, but I think adults have more to do once they move into these these sedentary villages, and that has a number of things to do with return rates of food resources that they're, they're taking. And so they start handing kids off uh, and letting kids go go play with all of your, your peers. And there's larger numbers of kids, so they're not out there alone, which is a dangerous thing for, say, a, a Jikwasi kid um, to be out you know, alone. So, so that you get this different modal personalities when you move from nomadic to very sedentary settlements, which to me just seems to play into the creation of the kinds of personalities that are going to um, uh, be more aggressive, favor more aggressive activities, more gender stereotyping. Okay, I, I did remember something else that the Whitings found in the Six Culture Study. Um, there are clear differences in aggressive behavior in children, boys and girls, depending on context. So to, 
to go to your point, if, you, if children are around peers, there's much more, significantly much more aggression being exhibited, which is why I think middle school is the most horrible invention <laughs> in the world. Um, if any kid around an adult, aggression goes down, uh, as well as around infants. Um, and in my own study in Kenya, looking at boys who are doing girls' work, I specifically looked at babysitting. And boys who babysat, the more they babysat, the less aggression they exhibited. Uh, so I just want to add that. Thank you. I can just add a little bit of an anecdote to that. Um, I spent a couple of years uh, studying tribal Serbs in the mountains of Montenegro. And uh, one of their uh, means of socialization for aggression was singing heroic epics while playing a very doleful sounding one string cello. Um, and uh, those would be in the evening in the winter uh, when no, there wasn't much work to be done. And the entire household, uh, or a number of households, would meet, and then there would be uh, epic singers singing these uh, tales of basically how many Turkish heads could be cut off in a raid, or how many women could be abducted. Um, and I watched the children very carefully because I was interested to see what the socialization impact was. And these uh, three years is what was asked here, up to three years. I'd say right about at that threshold is where the kids would stay awake and they would fall asleep, but obviously fascinated, totally engrossed in these tales of how to be aggressive, et cetera. So uh, I think that uh, we have ways of socializing children to be aggressive that are very, very effective in, in, in warfare societies uh, just telling about warfare uh, has a socialization effect. Um, now, I'd like to have uh, we end the program perhaps with a duet, which would be Polly and Carol. And I have a question for them, if Polly could come up. And here is the question. Are there any societies where women are aggressive at all? For example, American women's prisons. I leave you with this question. <laughs> You, you might know more about it than we do. Well, I've never been in a women's prison. <laughs> I, I, um, there is a very interesting study I know of that Victoria Burbank did of uh, a female aggression in, uh, in Australian Aboriginal mm -hmm. groups. Uh, and she found quite a lot. Um, and uh, not probably as lethal as male aggression, but it was quite... Uh, in her view, quite quite high, um, and the um, well, I don't know if you have well, another example. I, I would say there's just quite a bit of murder of second wives or a competitor. So so women are quite aggressive, not only when people threaten their children, but also when they threaten their their bond with a male. And so in anger, you know, quite often. Uh, uh, one wife will kill another wife. So that would be an example of female aggression. But I, I need to say that, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a society that doesn't have female aggression. Yeah. There, males, when we talk about males being more aggressive than females, there's aggression by everybody some of the time in some of the places. It's just a question of statistical difference in uh, proportion, just like uh, males are typically taller than females. That doesn't mean there aren't some women who are taller than men. Uh, well, yeah, well, I would say one thing I've, re I've really noticed among the Bushmen, males, to avoid conflict, will often put the task of bitching onto females. So if there's something they don't like, I mean, I looked at, at uh, I did a study of gossip, and really nasty gossip, and most of the time, the men would back away from it, even though it was their problem, and they'd get their wives to go for it. Because men, if they you know, criticize other men, risk fighting. While if they do it through the women, all the men say, ah, oh, those are just women bitching. But they, everybody hears it, and everyone's aware of the problem. Uh, 
Let, let me end with an, another anecdote from Montenegro. In Montenegro, uh, these people believe deeply in vengeance. We've seen quite a bit about uh, the Middle Eastern vengeance pattern in general, and they're part of it. And normally it's the male who takes vengeance for uh, a, a, the death of a kinsman. However, there's a sub-rule that says that although women are exempt from the feud, they're never killed in feuds, if there is no male who is either courageous enough or present to take vengeance if, let's say, her husband or son is killed, the woman can actually take vengeance by stepping into the male role. Uh, the, my favorite example is a woman whose husband uh, killed somebody, uh, got a, a short prison sentence, and got out of prison, and she walked up, up to him in the public park in Titograd, Montenegro, and basically said, thou hast killed my husband, I now take thine life, Blowy. Uh, so uh, it is possible that uh, we, we could argue forever about women and men and their basic dispositions to kill, but there are cultural ways in which women can be channeled into a male role in order to do that. Uh, let me finally say uh, thank you very much. So after that intellectually stimulating and fascinating yet deeply disturbing symposium, <laughs> I cannot but help think back to the last symposium we had, which was on birth to grandmotherhood, child rearing and human evolution could have been called Women in Human Evolution. So maybe it's time to turn over the world to the fairer and gentler sex. Yeah. Well, I don't know, that may be a new series of problems. <laughs> but seriously, uh, the fantastic thing about humans is we can modify our genes with culture. And so I actually came from a male, this statement. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. <laughs> and so that's the concept of nonviolence, a completely non-genetic thing, which is a complete cultural invention that, that can completely dominate. And of course, then we had Martin Luther King and even a reformed terrorist who became uh, a nonviolent person. And now that women have been liberated, they've entered the scene. And Democracy suggests political and social changes without violence. I don't mind if I have to sit on the floor at school. All I want is education. I'm afraid of no one. So with that, thank you to those who made the symposium possible, to our featured speakers, our individual supporters, and to the audience for attending and for your great questions. Thank you. <laughs>